hungry trilobite podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon. Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention is ready to return in 2023. SoonerCon 31 will be held in Norman, Oklahoma on June 30th through July 2nd, 2023. Gaming, cosplay, autographs, and an art auction await. Visit SoonerCon.com for more details. The Hellmouth Convention, where fandoms bleed together. Evoking the center of the mystical convergence, our event includes fandoms and travelers from all over the world. Like the Hellmouth itself, things gravitate toward it that you might not find elsewhere. The celebration is scheduled for June 9th through 11th, 2023 in Los Angeles, California. Go to thehellmouth.org to plan your visit. On tap today, we have Janine Michaelis coming back. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Aaron, how are you? I'm doing great. We had a good chat not that long ago. It was in episode, double checking the number, 143. And we had a great chat back and forth right after that. And you came up with this really great idea, something that I'd kind of kicked around in my head a few times, but nobody else had really brought up until you did. But the idea that if you grow up with a limited exposure to mainstream TV, it affects you very profoundly in how you pursue art, how you pursue your interests. And we both had different reasons for saying that. Right. But we both agreed wholeheartedly. So why don't you just kind of let me know what your thought process was? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, and I, I think I mentioned before, like I had kind of a sheltered-ish upbringing. Um, And so I've gone through phases of kind of seeing that as a positive thing or a negative thing. Um, And I kind of vacillate back and forth between those, but, but there, I think there are some positives that have become apparent to me kind of later in life. So um, my, my parents let me watch limited TV. And we had, I think we, we did not have cable. I think we had 13 channels. Um, and I remember watching TV like right after school, um, but no more than that. So it was kind of like, I saw Saved by the Bell. That was something that I got to see. Um, and then my dad recorded some movies from TV onto VHS tapes. So we had some of those and those ranged from Disney movies to um, Star Wars. But other than that, like there wasn't a lot more media um, coming in to my kind of early childhood. So I think that's a little bit interesting. And the other interesting piece of that is um, because we didn't have a lot of TV, my sister and I would um, play with Barbies quite a bit. <laughs> and I know I know those might be problematic. However, um, I kind of see, looking back, I see that as something where we were basically, um, you know, putting on our own TV. So we had a cast of characters. Um, they all had names, they all had backstories, they interacted with each other, um, and I can see how we would apply the TV we were seeing, so it'd be like, Saved by the Bell meets Star Wars, (laughs) Um, plot lines, and kind of drama in space, and um, eventually became a space opera that I, you know, I still remember, like, the plot, and the names, and the um, the details. So finding that balance between what you're consuming and what you're producing and setting that tone early on of, I think we were kind of creating just as much as we were consuming, if not more, or there was some kind of balance there. So, yeah. I think that's natural for kids to do it, mm-hmm. and I think that circumstances like you just described there do kind of bring it out very well mm-hmm. uh, I just to kind of give a counter example 
I remember I was into the things that you would expect uh, a boy in the late 80s to be into. I had a collection of Transformers and Ninja Turtles and Ghostbuster figures. And I can distinctly remember as each of those things were kind of falling out of fashion and mm -hmm. the, the world was kind of moving on to the next thing, rather than getting bored with them, I would kind of reinvent how I played with them. I would create new characters out of them, much in the same way I think you're describing your Barbies being used. Right, right. That creativity and and it is so instinctive as a kid, but um, teaching yourself storytelling and action and what, you know, finding the story that excites you and, and the, the play of it, the freedom of it. And there was a very specific methodology I would use to it. And I would actually make specific scenes and the, the placement was always very important. I, I was really looking into composition long before I even knew what that was. And right. yeah. That's so cool. That's so cool. And um, if you, if you don't mind, you talked a little bit about um, your TV as a kid experience. And I thought that was just exceptionally interesting. Well, thank you. Uh, as I was kind of explaining to you, I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania. And whereas you didn't have cable in that area, you had to have cable because the terrain was so mountainous that there was not really a reliable way to deliver over the air signals. So if you didn't have cable, you didn't watch TV, period. Mm -hmm. And there was this point at which my family, for various reasons, decided to ditch the cable and go with a satellite dish that honestly did not work that well. So I went from having the same channels everybody else in school had to this satellite dish, which carried a few channels that were that I was interested in. And if they worked, I could watch that. And that was about it. And then we joined the Columbia House Video Club and I could get a lot of movies. So I started watching a crazy amount of movies. But this really limited me to I could watch Mystery Science Theater 3000, anything on Comedy Central. I, I started watching a lot of the weird movie channels at like 3 a.m. where they would reshow old monster movies and, and things along those lines. Uh, weird PBS feeds from uh, uh, I don't even know why they were even on satellite, but they were at some point. I, it, you. At that point, it was very weird. It wasn't like now where you just get your, your dish network and you could got essentially the TV guide channels on there. This was like anything you could pick up off the air, you could watch. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, Korean golf or something was available if you had an interest in it. Right. Right. Um, and as you're talking, I'm picking up a couple of things I didn't really think about before, but the, you know, I think the weird aspect is certainly a positive, right? <laughs> like, that's, I'd agree. That's just pure, purely interesting and inspires creativity. Um, yeah, but also the, um, and I'm going to sound, I'm going to sound I'm like I'm saying kids these days, you know, but <laughs> the ability to, um, to kind of, learn to limit your intake and appreciate, slow down and appreciate what you have and what you have access to. I think it's almost like a lost skill, um, you know, where we're just, we're consuming, consuming more and more and more and it becomes addicting um, and you just lose the ability to really sit with something and enjoy it. it that's true. I to maybe try to make a comparison between what we have now and what I had then. I, at first, it's amazing to realize you have a thousand channels you can look through and it's overwhelming. And then you realize I'm not going to watch Korean Frisbee all that much. I'm really not going to be that interested in watching a, a the, uh, you know, the equivalent of C-SPAN out of Brazil, you start to realize that what you want is very, it, it's there and you just have to work, seek it out, whether it's a certain channel, a certain time, and you start to realize, oh, hey, I've really found I enjoy sitting down and watching these monster movies. Or, you know, if I find a, an educational program out of you know, some, you know, studio out in Oregon or something, you start to really appreciate those things. And then people start looking at you funny, like, why are you watching this? Because they're watching what everybody else is watching. Right, right, right. Um, 
And I think you made another comment um, before about how you, um, you had learned that things don't always um, stick around. So if you really, if you really care about something, um, you like to hang on to it. I thought that was interesting. Too. Very much so. Uh, that was at the point where, you know, I couldn't count on seeing something twice because, you know, I had this weird system that I didn't know when stuff was coming in or why. So I would always habitually tape stuff. The mm -hmm. idea was at the time you, you used a VCR to record stuff in case you missed it, but I might want to come back and see it again. And I was finding all these programs that other people couldn't even believe existed. So I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm going to record this because at some point I'm going to want to show this to somebody so they don't think I'm making it up. <laughs> and I've had a lot of those kinds of tapes where it's like, no, seriously, you got to see this. <laughs> and, and I followed that through. Like for ages, I would habitually tape, you know, like, Right now, it seems crazy, but I would tape Star Trek because it was like, I yeah. don't know if I'll get a chance yeah. to see this episode any, anytime soon. There was there was a time you couldn't see it anytime you turned around. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, and if we want to get dystopian, like we're, we're in this period of glutton access right now, but things can things could change. You never know what's going to happen. And they yeah. already are. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. granted, if you want to watch what Disney is putting out, you're you're probably set. You're in good shape. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the things that are popular, you don't have too much trouble finding that. But yeah. when you get two steps to the left, right. where would you go to watch Gilligan's Island? I'm not saying it's not there, but it's not an obvious answer. It might not be available. I know it's on DVD right now. Yeah, yeah and that's a great point. Um, I think... Um... At one point, my sister was trying to watch all the Oscar nominated films and some of them she had trouble finding, which I find a little disturbing, mm -hmm. you know, back from the 30s. And yeah, especially that's that's the era where unless it was an all time classic, there might not be the effort to put it onto a physical disc or put it onto a streaming service. It might just sit there and like perpetually somebody's third or fourth priority and, and never quite the one they want to put out that month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I know for in particular, it's really hard when you get to like the silent era where there's a handful of movies that people know about and talk about and, and there's a wealth of them that are just sitting there waiting to be shown. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's... <sighs> crazy it, it is it is and and people like you and i appreciate this and we we see that as like a, a treasure hunt of trying to find right. something new and exciting that we know is there right. and if it can't be monetized right away in a very specific fashion there's not really an interest in putting it out there and, and people are like you and i are saying but it should be available as a library as an archive just so we can study it and appreciate it right um yeah absolutely yeah, I, it's crazy to think about what what could happen or what we could be losing. It, it is, and we all have to do is look at what's already been lost, the the, the books, the, the movies, the, the mm -hmm. shows that, I mean, just the easiest example I can think of right off the top of my head, the, 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 there's no copy of the first Super Bowl, which seems oh, like it's, really? yeah, really, it doesn't exist. Huh. <laughs> and, and you would think something that's like of such a, a it's this major thing that we do every year and is a TV, yeah. you know, uh, tradition and there's right. just, it's not there. Right. And, and fans like, you know, geeks like us talk like the yeah. early Doctor Who's, there's some very famous missed episodes of that, which it seems slightly more understandable because it was a, a, a more obscure show for a while, kind mm -hmm. of. I mean, granted, it's 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 huge, but you, you kind of accept that maybe in the '60s, not so much. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, it's uh, it feels like we're losing part of our identity, you know. And uh, our identity as creators, right? because it's so hard for us to look at what's come before us and mm -hmm. and say, yeah, this these were the mistakes that were made. This is these were the the gems that were missed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, how often, for, for example, you look through the library, you pick out a book or a movie, and it's something that's really ne- you don't even never heard of it before, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it ends up being one of your all time favorites. You just stumble on it, and it's like, how did I miss this? And you you feel like you you almost owe it to the world to kind of pump this up a little bit. Right. Right. For sure. Yeah. Um, and not quite the same thing, but I remember, um, I think it was Sherman Alexi, a writer made some comment about like, he, he has trouble not finishing books. You know, if he starts a book and he's not sure about it, or it's not quite his thing, he, he finishes it because he's like you just you just never know you just never know what's in there and what turn is going to happen and how it's going to surprise you and he's like time and again you know you find these little gems and nuggets and buried treasure in in amateur writing or any kind of writing you know um and I've found that I've certainly found that to be true I've become a lot more comfortable being able to say that I find items of value in something and acknowledging that maybe it doesn't gel as a whole once I'm done with the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And, and there are so many times I will pick up something and say, this really wasn't that good, but man, there's this one scene, there's this one line, there's this one idea that I can't mm-hmm. let go of. And there have been times I've kept something in my collection just because of that one little moment. Right. Right. Um, yeah, is is that a good segue into Dinosaur Planet? Are we talking about Dinosaur Planet or not? <laughs> I, I, you know, I've given it some more thought. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to actually go through and flip through the book again like I had planned, but I have really yeah. given a lot more thought to it. I liked our notes on it. Mm-hmm. And I, as I'm thinking about, it was a really cool concept. Yes. And I, I liked how you, 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 I seem to enjoy your notes on it more than I enjoyed the book itself. If that makes you feel better or worse, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, the same. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of, I kind of felt the same. Like I, it wasn't, it had, it had some issues I felt and, um, it wasn't to your point, it wasn't as strong as it could have been in the second half. Um, but I still, I still got a lot out of it. It still like sparked my imagination and my, um, you know, it made me want to go go there like write a story located on dinosaur planet you know Mm -hmm. so um yeah and i also are we are can we do spoilers we can do whatever you want okay the book's been out long enough we can deal with it (laughs) um yeah it it felt like it felt very moralistic because she's kind of, she's kind of talking about, you know, there's this people that um, are very um, aggressive and they are bloodthirsty and they like to eat meat, put very, you know, very black and white. And then there's a gentle people who do not like to eat meat and they're vegetarians. And so she's kind of comparing, contrasting them. Um, And it's both like, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is either way too simple or it's like deeper than I'm understanding it to be. Yes, you know that's, I, mean? I had a very similar feeling coming through with it because I kept feeling like, am I missing something or am I giving it too much credit? And I wasn't sure how that was playing out in my head there, because quite honestly, I I understand the conflict of eating meat versus not eating meat as a moral issue. I have friends on both sides of that fence. I've talked about my dietary habits here, so I don't think I need to retread that ground. But the fact is, I'm not accepting this as the ultimate value judgment in the story. I realize the author is. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I, I the, the the conversation is a side chat as far as I'm concerned here. Mm-hmm. So I was never able to get that sense of drama. And I feel like there was probably some effort to try to make it some big, like you say, some deeper meaning. And 
I just, I wasn't seeing it. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling it, but it did make me, it did make me stop and think. It sounds like it made you stop and think too. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, just kind of um, philosophically, like what, it, it made me think about kind of my, my relationship with food and also my relationship with violence. <laughs> and um, I, I went through this period of life, this was a couple years ago where I got interested in hunting, just kind of a random thing for um, suburban raised person to get interested in. But, um, you know, I had some friends who liked to hunt and it was for food, they would hunt deer for food and, um, and it was both appalling and intriguing, you know, that you're choosing to hunt down this animal and kill it so you can eat it. Um, but at some point, I, I feel like I transitioned from being a very gentle soul who would never hurt an animal to being someone who I wondered if I could um, challenge myself to, you know, because I, I was already eating meat, challenge myself to kind of face it and look at look it in the eyes and participate in the process. And also wondering if I could be, um, just learn to participate in that um, kind of natural life cycle ecosystem, <laughs> um, predator prey triangle that I'm already a part of, but actively participate in it. So, um, so this book kind of brought up a lot of that for me um, personally and just questioning how I, how I have changed and I've become, I've certainly, I certainly have an edge now that I never, as a, as a young person, never thought I would have that. That's really, really a, a very high level way to look at it. And it's really gives a lot of mindfulness to the matter that I don't think a lot of people put forth, including myself in a lot of ways. I'll be very honest with you, because although I, I struggle with the idea of eating meat at the same time you know you've got three meals in the day and not everything you think of not everything you do can require a whole lot of thought and sometimes I, I take the easy way out and I freely admit that but I think a lot of people should do what they're doing what you're doing I should say and just saying why am I doing this what's my comfort level with it what are the trade-offs I'm willing to make in my life to get where I am to 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 have what I want and that's that's a really powerful idea, and I, I think that your view of it is probably more structured than Dinosaur Planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we, maybe we should write a sequel. But um, yeah, there you go. But but that's the beauty of books, you know. Books as conversation. Um, I, which sparks another thing. I started reading recently, Speaker for the Dead by. Um, Orson Scott Card, um, and in in the intro, he has a paragraph about what um, what writing is to him. And it, if I can awkwardly paraphrase, it's it's like a contract and a conversation between author and reader. So he brings like fifty percent of it, but the reader brings the other fifty percent, and it is really a conversation. So it's like you know, you're reading Dinosaur Planet, and even though she's not sitting there with you, um, you're, you're bringing half of the inspiration and ideas and thoughts. And I think that's really cool. There's something I took from a book by Bill Watterson at the end of his career writing Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, he wrote a, a long book on exactly why he did what he did the way he did it. And a lot of his work was talking about art from a higher level and trying to say, well, what is art? He was actually making a commentary on people who go and try to put art into specific categories and say, this is good art, this is bad art. He really wanted to get away from that. Right. And and I'm, I don't want to butcher his words, so I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase. He essentially said, in my mind, the way I interpret it was that 
art is essentially the meeting of the artist perception and the audience's perception mm -hmm. that both are important and the artist doesn't get to determine what is art and the audience alone doesn't get to determine what is art it is simply when when you put both together what's the end result mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of what you were saying there yeah. yes absolutely yes yeah it's it's almost like um yeah a new creation in the participation between creator and reader. In another episode, mm -hmm. I talked about uh, how you define art. And I, I said, I have a very, very basic definition, which kind of sidesteps all of this is that anything that you put your mind to and try to do well is art, even if it's not creative, even if it's just a very mm -hmm. practical how to the fact that you did it well is art. Mm -hmm. So when you have somebody who looks at, a, you know, a pulp novel, and they say, well, this is an art, this is trash. Yes, it is art. It might be crap. It might be bad art. But bad art is still by definition, art, right. you don't get to take away the fact that it's art just because you think it's bad art. Right, right. And it can still provoke, right? Mm -hmm. Like it still has, it still can have power. Um, and that's so cool. And so many times art, the, the, the provocativeness that you'll find, I don't think that's a word, sorry. Um, but but the, the power of art to provoke doesn't necessarily come from what the artist intended. And we have to allow for those moments where something slips in that's, that some context comes along later on that's completely changes it that's not wrong to notice that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but we we have you know, things that that you know culture ch changes around it and we look at something from way back when and we say oh that that makes me feel very different than the way the artist intended and that's okay in fact it might be more valuable absolutely it's another reason i'm not a fan of pushing art to the side just because it falls out of fashion it's like yeah but if we find we dislike something now that mm -hmm. might be a reason alone to keep it around because that reaction has value right right absolutely and i think um not that i i'm not i don't know any of the names of the people i'm thinking of when i think of famous painters and artists but um Yes, the the very talented and thoughtful ones, I think intentionally at times push against what's normal. Um, and yeah, if, if society reacts in kind of a disgusted way, that might be the intention of the artist, you know, to kind of point out that disgust and maybe question it. <laughs> It might be, and it might even be the wrong move. It might be the case where, you know, you know, comedy, for example, is always supposed to be pushed in the envelope. Mm -hmm. And you're, you, the comedians will tell you they don't know if a joke goes too far until they try it out. And sometimes it does. And sometimes they have to have that pushback. It's like, yeah. okay, yeah. that was a step too far. Yeah. But yeah. they don't know until they do that, that that right. flexibility right. has to be built into the system. Right. And uh, I forget who said it, but yes, a comedian was saying, you know, we need room, we need room to play. It's always been that way <laughs> and it, and it will always be that way. But, and I totally, I understand that. And as a, you know, not as a comedian, but as a aspiring writer and artist, I understand that too. And I, I think I described before, you know, I'm always kind of at war with my perfectionistic self, like let's just pretend that there are no rules for a second. And That's yeah. That's it's not necessarily the, the freedom to try the freedom to play. It's the freedom to screw up, to screw up maybe yes. badly. Yes. And yes. that's, right. you have to give yourself mm -hmm. that, you know, let yourself work without the net. Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting there. <laughs> we all are. We all are. Yeah. And yeah, we, we take for granted sometimes, again, because we have so much content, because we have so much very, very good content, yeah. we lose an appreciation for what it's like to just throw something out there that's completely raw, that's unfinished, that's rough around the edges, and look for the value in what's yeah. at the core. 
Yeah, and you know, kind of circling back um, to what we were saying earlier about TV, you know, I think we, given our experiences, we have kind of a, an eye for that, right? To be able mm -hmm. to, um, a skill set to first of all be able to listen, give something a chance, and then look, um, look at it in its rawness and see the value in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, right now we have the glut of marvel movies especially it's everywhere you can't walk into you can't turn on the tv without tripping over them and yeah. they're perfect i mean it, yes. it, technically yes. on a tech you can hate them yes. as as material but on a technical level they are perfect yes every every line is perfectly crafted the the, the visuals are 100 percent. Right. but the fact is if you are somebody like me who's been into comics since you could read you remember a time when there were just this slew of weird 90s superhero one-off movies and they were rough around the edges right. and somebody right. picking them up now would say what is this this is garbage this is like right. the great value brand superhero movie but you had to be able to look at it and see oh hey they pulled this off really well or this was a neat idea i'd like to see this and i feel like that's a skill set that is not in today's audience as much as it should be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think maybe I mentioned last time, um, Jeff Wheeler is a fantasy author um, and he, you know, he has writing his books down to like a science. He, he outlines and it's very formulaic and, you know, he's closely, works close with his publisher and his editor. They buy the book, based on the outline right so it's just I it kind of rubbed me the wrong way and they're I, I haven't read them I, I assume they're great books they're selling very well they're very popular um but contrasting that with somebody like I think I heard George Saunders recently he's like a short story guy um where he he can't write unless he connects with the fun element. And he also can't write well, he said, if he knows how it's going to end. So if he, if he outlines, that's kind of a creativity killer for him because he likes to be led by kind of the unknown and the mystery of what's going to come out. Um, so I just thought, that was really cool. And I think um, it's kind of clear in their products too, that they're just, they're just two different things, right? Kind of like Marvel, like it's a certain thing. And yes, I, I enjoy it. It's fun. <laughs> um, but some of the, just the power and mystery of some of these other risky creative works is you can definitely see the difference. It's the the constant argument between the pantsers and the plotters. Yeah. <laughs> and I've never yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we're all so different. We all think mm -hmm. in such different ways. That's why there, there's such a value in being able to go to the bookstore and pick from literally thousands of authors. So is it that much of a surprise that we come up with these stories in different ways? Is it really that hard to believe? Yeah. And we I, all I, borrow from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we we see these arguments on on you know writing forums and in writing community, especially if you ever get together in person with somebody and try to talk about these things. Everybody's convinced that their method is the one. <laughs> yeah, you, it can't work the, otherwise. No, you got the girl on your right hand side who has a you know ten page outline that is in perfect. Uh, you know, MLA format, and they had their Roman numerals on there, and even their handwritten notes are in perfect penmanship. And then you got the dude on your left hand side who, like, hasn't slept in a week, and mm. it appears to be consisting on like Cheez Its, and he's got like a handful <laughs> of napkins <laughs> with marker on them. <laughs> and, you know, his notes are like, guy number one says it's the ch chick number two. And but they're both going to come out with a script or a story or yes. whatever right. if they keep at it. Right, 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 right. And yeah, and we're all so different. We're all mm -hmm. built so differently and our brains are all different. 
And if you, you look at, you know, all the best-selling authors out there, name them, I don't care. It just, just pick five names. They didn't have the same method, which says to me, if you end up with a book on the shelf, it doesn't really matter how it got there. Right. Right. And to, and to me, it's always interesting to hear authors say that um, no two of their books are the same. You know, they're like, you, if you finish a book, that's, that's great. And the next one is you're starting all over again. <laughs> it's like you forget everything you knew and you, you begin again. Um, yeah. Are you a fan of the Coen brothers? Yes. Okay. Interesting. I, I like their movies. I did mm-hmm. do. I have a couple of them at least. And the ones I've seen, I've liked. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. When somebody asked me if I was a fan of the movies, I couldn't actually give an answer <laughs> because there's nothing consistent about each one across the board. They're all their own thing. So for me to just put them in a group and give them a yay or nay, I couldn't do it. You're like, name a movie and I'll tell you. (laughs) Yeah, I really need to do this on a case-by-case basis here. So I was actually impressed that you were able to just give me a solid yes very quickly there. Yeah, well, I I think what jumped into my head, they did Fargo, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I feel like they, they have crossed the bar in my mind <laughs> where I'm always going to be, you know, and again, it's, it's kind of like saying good art or bad art. I, I don't even know if I think about it in terms of if I like it or don't like it, but it, it is inspiring and new and fresh and original and yeah and all of those things and what they what they do with character in that way too so yes so I'm I'm a fan because I'm always going to be curious and check out whatever they make (laughs) and and there are those moments and this could go off on a whole weird tangent by itself but there are the times when you'll you'll find something that you experience and it doesn't matter it doesn't care if you like it or not, it's just going to be there. Just like you said, for you to take the ride. Um, to, to give one example, I about 10 years ago, I watched the French movie, Fantastic Planet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Have you? Okay. It's, well, let's just say I didn't watch it twice. But I, I can see it's brilliant in terms of it's the, the mood it creates and the message it has. And I'm, I'm sure you can think of a work that, that affected you this way. It's like you can, it hits you in a very profound way. And I can, the artistry is top notch. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it hits, you, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't feel comfortable with this. And I, I understand why they never let France have a space program, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. And I, and I have those too. Um yeah, I think, uh, what was that movie? Melancholia by Lars. I, I think I saw that once and I was I like- I know the name. I, I don't like, know the, I haven't seen the movie. It is it is spot on. It is amazing. And I was like, I'm never going to watch this again. <laughs> um, but that speaks to its success and in, in affecting me, right? Like, um, yeah. It just, it connected with me right between the eyes. I'm like, yes, mm-hmm. I understand. I get it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is a lot. I must go away now. Yes, yes. And <laughs> I tend to, to go, I use movies as my go-to when it comes to art, just because there's so much, it affects you on every sense. You have the audio, the video, and to some sense it's a tactile feel. You have a story, it goes into the mind. And I, I find that's a little bit more helpful than say, a book because it's a much quicker experience. It's like 90 minutes and change. Yes. And you can kind of help work somebody on with on different levels rather than relying on simply what they're talking about with the text. I find that that, and we get that off in the weeds when we talk about just text. And now somebody like yourself, for example, we had a good chat on Dinosaur Planet. I bet you if we pick 
three more books, we could do the same thing with them. You can't get that with everybody on the street. That's been my experience. Sure. Sure, 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 sure. Um, yeah, accessible is important. I actually, um, kind of on a tangent, but I actually had a thought recently about Disney movies. And we all, I think, I don't know how you feel about that. I think we all kind of love to hate them because they're successful and, um, yeah, like you kind of like you said about Marvel movies, like they're they're perfect and they're shiny and they're successful and they're formulaic and all of those things. But um, the power in their accessibility and the fact that they kind of transcend and touch so many, unite so many people with the same experience. Like I I got to see some of them in my conservative childhood bubble. And I can meet someone from a different culture who has also seen that same movie at that same age <laughs> and connect with them on that level. Um, and I heard the woman who sang um, the voice of Pocahontas, you know, she talks about um, when people hear her singing voice, they'll burst into tears because they remember it from their childhood and just the um the power of that is kind of amazing not to say that um disney uses their power perfectly but um yeah i i find i find that to be pretty amazing and for someone again raised how i was raised it's a a way to connect with people that would be difficult for me to not have that let me please grant me for just a minute the freedom to speak out of both sides of my mouth here. Sure. Because I think this topic warrants it. It's my personal view that there really hasn't been a Disney movie in about 20 years. <laughs> what we've had since then has been roughly a bunch of Pixar projects which have used a lot of Disney assets here and there, but really Pixar has kind of become its own thing. And I'm glad it has because they are some great movies in their own right. Disney has used, they have remade a lot of their movies. I don't really feel anything for those good or bad. They simply exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't hate any of it, but it, none of it grabs me. And on the other hand, we talk about the movies that I think you were more referring to, mm -hmm. you know, the cell drawn animation or the very, very early CGI movies when they were just figuring out how it worked. Right. And those are the movies that tend to connect across cultures, across age groups. Everybody has seen The Jungle Book, whether they saw it in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. Everybody knows that movie. Everybody Amazing knows Snow White. Amazing yes. music in that yes. movie. Yeah. And so as much as I could criticize Disney on some of their business decisions, and I have, it would be wrong of me, morally wrong of me, to deny that ability of them to connect people the way you just described. Mm -hmm. You are 100% right that they do that. And, and th that is why they have the media empire they do is because they found a way to make that connection, sometimes with a hammer, but they found a way to make that connection. And that connection mm -hmm. means something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and not to go too deep into it, but um, thinking, <laughs> thinking about the movie Pocahontas getting into my home where I was a child, um, where, you know, I was told that um, we, my, my home did not value the environment to put it succinctly my home did not value the environment and i'm listening to um this character sing about how you don't know what you don't know and if you get to know the environment you learn that it's really worth saving and so i have no idea how that affected my subconscious but that was able to get into my home and into my brain at a very young impressionable age <laughs> And uh, and I don't 
you know, I, who knows my journey out of that way of thinking, but I did journey out of that way of thinking. So yeah, I think that's very powerful. Just as another example, uh, trying to think exactly how old I was, I'm going to say I was like 11 going on 12 when the satellite dish was put in. And this was about the time that Disney had decided to finally re-release Fantasia for like the first time in ages Mm -hmm. after pretending it didn't exist for decades. Or they would like make a Christmas ornament of uh, Mickey from the Sorcerer's Apprentice, and they would just like not acknowledge that this was a thing that existed. They they just figured there was no money in at all, mm-hmm. and they said, "Well, well, these VHS tapes are selling really well. We'll finally try to try this again." Mm-hmm. And if you were watching the old Disney Channel as it existed at the time, when it was a premium channel that you paid per month to see you would see a 24 hour a day, seven day a week infomercial for the sort for Fantasia on VHS. If you watch the Disney channel, they had documentaries and behind the scene footage of how mm-hmm. they restored it, why mm-hmm. they never sold it, what they were doing to, you know, possibly make a new Fantasia. I, it was this constant barrage of information and 11 year old Aaron is like, wow, film history is pretty darn cool. This, and, and this is the stuff that nobody is talking about when they go mm-hmm. rent their movies at Blockbuster or whatever. It's like, this, this is like art. And I could understand that at 11 because I was watching the weird programming that nobody else was watching. This was like yeah. the, when you used to get the features on DVDs yeah. and, and you would learn about movies that way. This was like my version of that in the early early super early 90s that's that's awesome i thought so and and that's why now fantasia is still one of my favorite disney movies yes yeah no that's totally awesome and the the sequel they did i i find that and here's the weird thing because we're just talking about everything disney is doing these days it's like they made fantasia they made the sequel Mm -hmm which they admitted they lost money on. They just wanted to do it. But now they keep making these like reboots and rehashes. And I'm like, why don't you actually do more of the one movie that was designed to be done as a series? Yes. Yes. There's that. Yeah. 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 The sequels. Um, Yeah. And I, I relate, I relate to what you're saying about, I, I have my preferred Disney era, <laughs> mm-hmm. but I do, you know, I can't even imagine, I, I, I'm not a small person these days. I, you know, I can't imagine um, how they are relating to and consuming these more Pixar-like products that are coming into their homes and maybe Maybe it's the greatest thing ever. Maybe they're, you know, maybe it's their golden age of Disney. But I, yeah, but I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm trying to be open minded because I'm sure that our parents felt the same way looking at the stuff that we had. Mm-hmm. Although I, I really think that there, there was a a. Here's the weird thing. There was a golden age of Disney that you and I are probably both thinking of here when mm-hmm. everything was just fire. And they were um, an IP machine, but they stuck to their own IPs and they, they stayed in their lane. Yeah. That era did not last as long as we seem to think it did. It started in 89 with The Little Mermaid, and it basically was done by Pocahontas. That's sh- just shy of six years. Yeah. And, and to us, that seems like that's the way things always were and always should be. And it was like not even six years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they just every single one of those they just hit out of the park mm-hmm. the, and the music especially um yeah. everyone was an absolute stellar movie on its own mm-hmm. the cast the story everything was great like you said the music everyone had a musical soundtrack and score that was worthy of a release on its own and hype on its own Mm -hmm. everything had a merchandising push right behind it and a video release to tie it up and the second that video release was out the next one was waiting in the theaters ready to go it was a cycle they had down Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it unfortunately 
all nothing lasts forever but i mean we think that that was just the way all things always were and it really wasn't i mean if you look at the way disney was in like the mid 80s they were floundering they were really trying to go through the the closets and find stuff that was still worth selling yeah um have you seen the black cauldron speaking of things that are yes. weird disney side sidestep <laughs> it's been a minute but i have seen it yeah yeah it's been a minute for me too but that's another one where um i think yeah i think people think of it as like disney's dark moment or disney's oops or but i i think it's cool <laughs> how about atlantis I have, I have seen it. Um, and it, it has been a minute. Uh, charming. What, how did you think of it? I liked it a lot. In mm -hmm. fact, it was probably one of the few moments after that golden age where I'm like, oh, Disney is hitting it out of the park here. Mm -hmm. But that was also one of the cases where they tried to do sci-fi. And I think Disney is actually very good at doing sci-fi. They just don't like to do it very often. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I I did really enjoy that, and I I feel like the characterization was good. It kind of uh, hit some fireflyish notes in my brain. I don't know why. I think just the characters. Yes, and and the fact that they had Don Novello in there, which is a, a voice that I loved. And I'm like listening to this, and it's like, did I just hear Father Guido Sarducci in a Disney movie? <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> He's going to try and sell me a Christmas tree. Okay, for the three people in the audience that got that reference, thank you, thank you. I, I didn't get it, but I, it, I, it's, I, it's it's okay. I'll send you the YouTube video later. <laughs> okay. He, he he was a character on Saturday Night Live. Very distinctive voice. You're going to pick it out from the movie the second you get it. Cool. But yeah, it, and this is it's one of those things that I I do appreciate what they do. I appreciate what they've done. I even appreciate what they're doing now. I just feel like we need to be conscious of every uh, of every era of Disney, of every era of film. And uh, that's something we've done a lot on this show is just look at how we appreciate film as a culture rather than as individuals. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like I, we're talking about, you know, discovery on, you know, in personal and, and home theater versus discovering it in a drive-in and, was that something you did as a kid? As a kid? No, no, that was, that was later, which is funny. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing these days? Um, let's see. I am. So to be honest, I'm very, uh, I just, I just changed jobs. I changed my day job. So life just keeps coming at me. Um, but I am, I am committed to growing my creativity. I am a morning person. So I have been working on getting up early. So I, I um, had the opportunity to go to New York this year on my way back. <laughs> I live um, in Washington state, right? So on the way back, I kind of use that time change advantage to get up early. And I've been trying to maintain the getting up early. So I've been getting up at, um, uh, on the day, on the days I do, I've been getting up at four to, um, I have, I'm trying out a routine where I journal, then I go for a walk, then I write, and then I go to work. Um, so I am, working on a couple short story ideas right now and and it and to be honest it's a struggle you know like i i just started a new job four weeks ago but um yeah i'm gonna stick with it um i follow the kurt vonnegut museum which we we knew already i also follow the ray bradbury um group um, out of Indiana University. Um, and they just posted a contest 
or not not exactly a contest, but they posted that they are accepting submissions for their um, literary magazine um, short stories of science fiction that are inspired by or in the spirit of Ray Bradbury. So I kind of latched onto that. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> cool, cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think and that is in the deadlines in January. So I think if I can get one of these kind of polished up, um, I will send it there and see what happens. But yeah, but I'm always, I'm always trying to get back to um, novel writing. I think I told you I have, I have one that's kind of, I started writing it and then I kind of had a mental break. And so now I'm kind of at a place where do I come back to it or do I start a new project? And it's really interesting when you take a break for that long to come back to a project and look at it with different eyes. You know, I'm, I'm a different person than I was when I wrote it. Um, so it's almost like trying to decide do I want to stay true to that person? Do I want to stay true to her? <laughs> or do I want to stay true to me now? And which would probably be um, changing it. And do I, do I even want, am I still connected to it? Or do I need to start something new? So that's kind of on my back burner percolating while I'm working on short stories. And you have an Instagram account? I do. I do. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Samson.michael.inc, I believe, is my Instagram. And that's named after my dog. I have that in the show notes on the old episode you were on. I'll put that in the new one as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. And actually, I'm glad I brought up my phone. It says I still have it on the page for um, Ray Bradbury theme submission guidelines for Genesis, which is the um, University of Indiana publication. So check it out. Will do. Janine, thank you so much for coming back. I would love to have you back anytime at all. I'm looking forward to following the, your adventures and let's do this again sometime soon. Let's do it, Aaron. Thank you so much. Yeah.